say that, okay. What I really wanted to say before we get started is that I could talk about this topic forever. I, I could talk about it for hours. But what I would like to do, usually when I'm talking for about an hour, is to give you guys some things, um, some food for thought, something to think about, um, oops, um, things that you should just be thinking about as you're looking at this topic. And if you have any questions down the line or you wanna to talk to me a little bit more about some of the things that, that I mentioned here, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm very open to talking to people. People call me all the time. I'm always looking forward to interacting with people. So please do not think this would be the last time that you can interact with me or talk to me about employee engagement research because it's always very exciting to me. Also a little bit of background. I know Devin mentioned that I have written a book on this topic. Um, I spent about a year uh, not really focusing on my research with libraries per se. I actually interviewed companies around the world who, um, who were referred to me as really great places to work. And that meant that not only with their um, superiors or their CEOs or their, you know, whoever their directors were saying that it was a great place to work, but I talked to staff, a variety of staff, uh, um, and they told me and confirmed that the place was a, just a wonderful place. And my book really is, or all of my research is about just themes and other things that I found after talking to a lot of people and to see how that vibes of what was going on with libraries. So also when we, you know, I talking about different things, you want to think about like, what does your library do really well? And what things that you would want to, to work on as you guys move forward with creating better spaces. So the first thing I wanted to do is uh, one of the first um, uh, places that I visited uh, is called Great Place to Work. Um, they are the firm that does all of the research for the Fortune 100 top places to work or whatever. And they've been doing the, the background research for this for about, I think about 80 years. Um, they're based on, they're in the Bay Area. I went and spent some time with them. Um, this guy there is the CEO of the company. And not only do they do the research for um, national companies, but they also do it for international companies. So I want you guys to listen a little bit about what his research has confirmed, which, which makes a great place to work. Here we go. Cross our fingers and it's working. Hey, Elena, I think the sound for this is a little bit garbled right now. Um, but I, is there a way for us to maybe it is, is it too loud? No, it's just not coming through for some reason. Um, we did the optimized video clip. Did you check the box for optimized clip? Okay. Hmm. Mm. Well, maybe we'll go out and share it and then we'll see. Okay. And we'll stop sharing and see if we try it again. Yeah. And then also click the um, share computer sound. Um, yeah. Okay. Maybe that was it. I didn't do the share. Yeah. We survey C. Yeah, that sounds better. CEOs, police officers, truck drivers, cooks, engineers. If people are working, we've surveyed them. And what we know in terms of their happiness, workers all want the same things. There's 3 billion working people in the world, and about 40% of them would say they're happy at work. 
That means about 1.8 billion, or almost 2 billion people, are not happy at work. What does that do, both to those people and the organizations that they work in? Well, let's talk about money. Organizations that have a lot of happy employees have three times the revenue growth compared to organizations where that's not true. They outperform the stock market by a factor of three. And if you look at employee turnover, it's half that of organizations that have a lot of unhappy employees. The miracle thing is you don't have to spend more money to make this happen. It's not about ping pong tables and massages and pet walking. It's not about the perks. It's all about how they're treated by their leaders and by the people that they work with. So I'd like to share a few ideas that create happy employees. Idea number one, in organizations where employees are happy, what you find is two things are present, trust and respect. Leaders often say, we trust our employees, we empower our employees. And then when an employee needs a laptop, and this is a true example, 15 people have to approve that laptop. So for the employee, all the words are right, but 15 levels of approval for a $1,500 laptop, you've actually spent more money than the laptop on the approval. And the employee feels maybe they're really not trusted. So what can an organization do to have a high level of trust? The first organization that comes to mind is Four Seasons. They have magnificent properties all around the world. And their employees are told, do whatever you think is right when servicing the customer. To hand that trust to your employees, to do whatever they think is right, makes the employees feel great. And this is why they're known for delivering some of the best service in the world. Idea number two, fairness. The thing that erodes trust in our organization faster than anything else is when employees feel that they're being treated unfairly. Employees want to be treated the same, regardless of their rank or their tenure or their age or their experience or their job category compared to anyone else. When I think about great organizations who get fairness right, the first organization that comes to mind is Salesforce. They found that men and women working in the same job with the same level of proficiency were making different amounts of money. So immediately, they calculated the difference and they invested $3 million to try and balance things out. Idea number three is listening. So to be a listener who connects with all types of people, we have to unlearn a few things. We've all been taught about active listening and eye contact and intense stare and a compassionate look. That's not listening. Repeating what the person says, that's not listening being humble and always hunting and searching for the best idea possible, that's what listening is. And employees can feel whether you're doing that or not. They want to know when they talk to you and share an idea, did you consider it when you made a decision? The one thing that everybody appreciates and wants when they're speaking is to know that what they say matters so much, you might actually change your mind. Otherwise, what's the point of the conversation? We all know the things we need to change, the things that we need to do differently. The way you behave, the way you treat others, the way you respond, the way you support defines the work experience for everyone around you. Changing to be a better person, the world is littered with those failures. But changing because there's something you believe in, some purpose that you have, where you're willing to risk almost everything because it's so important to you, that's the reason to change. If it's not, you should probably find a different place to work. Okay, um, before I go to um, some of the overall things that they had, um, do you guys have any comments about the video at all? Um, any thoughts about what you just heard? Was it things that you guys had already heard before? Yes, it does seem really, really common sense. I do agree with you guys. It does seem very, very common sense, but a lot of times it isn't something that we're always doing. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, when you look at positive workplace culture for all, the reason I put for all is, is from my 
when I talk to companies and I've, and I've not only talked to companies that felt like they were doing well, but I also talked to companies that are in organizations, especially library organizations. I've talked to a lot of organizations that felt like that they were falling apart. They were having grievances, lawsuits. I've talked to places that have had multiple lawsuits. And what I found overall is that for the places that do have positive workplaces, cultures for all, focus in on for all, right? Usually what's, what's happening in a lot of organizations is that everybody in the organization is not having a similar experience. And what that means is that there might be one department that's doing well, another department that's falling apart, another department that's at odds with each other. Everybody is sort of siloed and not um, having the same experience. So one of the first things that the great place to work when I went to talk to them and other places told me is that the strategy has to be for all. It can't be, well, we'll do these things and some people are miserable and then some people are, are having the time of their lives. That's not the healthy organization. So when we're looking at these things, that we're looking at how can we intentionally create policies, procedures, and look at some of the root things that we're doing to create it for everyone and not just for some people. So if we look at this list here, um, some of the things that have been said over and over again that I heard um, that you guys can think about is that the company has everybody's back. And remember what I was saying, it can't be one department is great and then another department is literally at odds. They'd also need to respect everyone for their unique skills, talents, and abilities. And that means that, yes, that we can have some policies that fit for everybody, but we also have to recognize that people are all not exactly the same and that we need to be conscious of that in providing um, the kind of environment that lets people's talents grow, right? And not expecting one person to be exactly like the next person. Um, as you guys know, and this is happening a lot and probably coming up in uh, some of the other talks that you guys have, that workplace flexibility, especially after the pandemic, has been very, very important for people, not even if you are 100% remote, but at least if you have some kind of hybrid environment that allows for you some a little bit more flexibility tends to be uh, very positive right now. What I mean by people over policy, meaning that a lot of times what we've had, what I always call started our status quo, are some policies that have been created about 20, 25 years ago, and we are still using them, and they are not really doing us as an organization uh, um, very well. So we might have had something that said, for, for instance, everybody had to be at work all the time. And then when it came time to looking at a remote work, we, we cite that particular policy as a rule for the reason why we can't change. Um, so looking at not only the policies that we can see, but the policies we cannot see and see if that's still relevant and see if that is still moving us towards people over policy. Um, what's also really important, and I find this a lot in library organizations, is that we need to work to diffuse and resolve conflict. I think a lot of times, not all, I'm not saying this is all, but a lot of times we are conflict averse. And there's a lot of times that things have happened to people within the organization, trauma that has happened to people in organizations that just never get resolved. And people feel that there's no avenue for them to be able to talk about some things that are happening that is not making them feel well. Um, everybody can admit its mistakes without retribution and penalty goes without saying. Everyone can speak their mind or critique what's going on without retribution or penalty. And the number one thing, if you don't remember anything else from this talk, is that the only way that we can change our organizations is that we have to be very active working on the workplace experience. Every organization that I talk to that completely transformed their organization were very active in internal policies. A lot of times we spend a lot of our energy working on external right? We, we, we have our strategic plan. We have our goals and stuff. And our goals are usually about how we are projecting ourselves to our customers. And a lot of times we do not have those same strategies about how we want to create a positive workplace for all. 
And the only way that we're going to be able to do it is to spend that time and energy in it. We have to create, we have to be very, very intentional. It can't be left to chance and cross our fingers and hope for the best. So the next thing I want to talk to you, and I want, um, I did a polls everywhere for that, is a lot of times um, the most barrier for creating a positive workplace is status quo. And some status quo is good. I'm not going to say that every status quo is not good, but a lot of times when I talk to organizations, we get a lot of, well, this has happened and we tried this, or we're not going to try this, or we're not going to do this. And we always say, oh, we want to tackle status quo, but I find over and over again that it is very, very hard to change status quo. So just if you guys can write in some of your comments so everybody can see, what do you guys think within your particular organizations? How is status quo? Um, so your Zoom bar is covering up the link for, or the code for Poll Everywhere. Oh, okay. Let's see. See. You could share that link or code, whatever it is. Yeah, let's see. Let me see if I can do it. Um, oops. Um, it should be, let me move this up. Well, if you guys can, I don't know why it's acting weird. You guys can put it into the chat. I'll take a look at it through the chat. Why is it acting so strange? I'll take a look at your chat. Yeah, I tried to reshare it just uh, so Um, Yes, tradition. Doing more with less. Inertia, that's interesting. Micromanaging. Always tapping people to do the same task. That is very true. Saying one thing, but doing the opposite. No assessment. Feeling overloaded, yes. Teams that are close to outsiders. Yeah. No resources to make the workplace a better place. Laziness. <laughs> That's true. So all of that is true. Um, and what I've been finding, especially now in libraries, especially post, well, kind of, I'm not going to say post pandemic, but since we have been back to work is that burnout in, in burnout has, has been a major, major problem. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. So I wanted a few things I wanted to go over a few slides and and this is something that you guys can take back to your organizations a little bit later is that um, there is a what's called a mass hierarchy of needs when I went to, to talk to great places to work and even when I talked to Gallup, um, they talked about um, sort of the fallacy of everything being resolved through salary and benefits. And this also relates to DEI, because I know this is a DEI uh, webinar as well. So if you look at the, um, the slide itself um, and you look at it as uh, the Maslow hierarchy, if you look at security, security is where our pay and our benefits and all of our sort of safety needs are in with where security is. 
So it is definitely a basic need. It's something that we definitely need. So it's not something that I'm saying that, oh, we shouldn't, we didn't, don't need this at all. Of course, it's a basic need. But if you look over to the side, it says not engaged. And what that means is, is that you can have more money or more benefits or more perks and be engaged, but it's not a guarantee that you'll be engaged. Meaning that a lot of times if there's problems within the organization, you know, the number one solution is, oh, they just, they, if they would just get a little bit more, if we could just give them a little bit more money or we'd give them a little bit more perks or just sort of like what the guy said in the other video, like, oh, if we could just, you know, um, uh, give them some extra stuff, it'll be okay. And it's not necessarily adds up to engagement. So when you look up at there, the next stage is belonging. And that's almost engaged, right? Where you feel sort of like you belong to the organization. And actually the DEI work is actually at that belonging phase. Uh, so a lot of times when people ask me to come in and look at DEI policies, procedures or whatever, and a lot of it is focused in, oh, let's get someone here and give them a salary and benefits. The reason why a lot of that doesn't work out is because just like what you guys were saying in your comments, that doesn't necessarily add up to other things that the people in the organization need in order for them to feel like they are part of the organization. So belonging is part of it and also importance, feeling like you are important within the organization. And the top one, that self-actualization, only 2% of organizations throughout the whole world are at that top spot. When you look at importance, in terms of organizations that work really hard to get to that level, it's only about 10% of organizations worldwide. Belonging, it's about 15%. The majority of us are, haven't got further up than, than security. It's the majority of us are at security. And that's probably why it kind of directly relates to 60% of the workplace is disengaged at work. Because a lot of times we get here's your salary, here's your benefits, here's your job description, go. And there's that much more added on or value added within the organization. So always keep that in mind when someone says, oh, people will be fine if we just gave them a little bit more money. That's not necessarily the case. So the next thing, I know a few of you guys said something about trust. Um, hope now that we got this video thing working right, um, I want to have you listen to the premier guru on, on trust and other issues related to employment experience, which is Simon. I don't know if some, some of you guys have heard Simon, but this is to me a really, really good short clip of that kind of highlights um, some of the issues I think that relates to our leaderships. The way they define the terms, seals. And I asked them, like, who do you, how do you pick like the guys that go on SEAL Team 6, right? Because they're the best of the best of the best of the best. And they drew, a, they drew a graph for me. And on one side, they drew, they wrote the word performance. And on the other side, they, were, they wrote the word trust. The way they define the terms is performance on the battlefield and performance off the battlefield. So this is your skills. This is, did you make your quarterly earnings, whatever, however you want to translate it, right? Performance, it's traditional. This is, how are you off the battlefield? What kind of person are you? The way they put it is, I may trust you with my life, but do I trust you with my money and my wife? This is what they told me. Nobody wants this person, the low performer of low trust, of course. Of course, everybody wants this person, the high performer of high trust, of course. What they learned is that this person, the high performer of low trust, is a toxic leader and a toxic team member. And they would rather have a medium performer of high trust, sometimes even a low performer of high trust, it's a relative scale, over this person. This is the highest performing organization on the planet, and this person is more important than, than this person. And the problem in business is we have lopsided metrics. We have a million and one metrics to measure someone's performance and negligible to no metrics to measure someone's trustworthiness. And so what we end up doing is promoting or bonusing toxicity in our businesses, which is bad for the long game because it eventually destroys the whole organization. The irony is it's unbelievably easy to find these people. Go to any team and say, who's the asshole? And they'll...
they will all point to the same person. <laughs> Equally, if you go to any team and say, who do you trust more than anybody else? Who's always got your back? And when the chips are down, they will be there with you. They will also all point to the same person. It's the best gifted natural leader who's, getting, who's creating an environment for everybody else to succeed, and they may not be your most individual highest performer. But that person, you better keep them on your team. So what do we think about that? What are your comments about that? One of the things that as you guys are writing your comments in is what's fascinating with me is that I've had some people say that libraries are not susceptible to that, but I, I really do think we are just as susceptible to this strategy than anybody else. I don't, I think a lot of times we focus in, especially when we're picking people who are managing or leading or are over the organization, we look for these performance metrics and we're not necessarily looking for trust metrics. We're not looking for the soft skills. And even if we are looking for soft skills, if you look back to our position descriptions when we're looking for these kinds of, of people, there's nothing there that is measuring um, trust metrics, um, whether they're listening, empathetic, um, whether, you know, they're the type, do they have evidence where they do uh, have your back? And a lot of times we do elevate people who, who have a lot of outcomes, who have a lot of, you know, stuff, you know, on their resume, but necessarily are we looking at how they normally will elevate the staff around them? Elena, do you yes. think that these high performance, low trust folks also might be kind of cherry picked for middle management or like upper management more and more in libraries? Did you see anything like that? Yes, yes, they, they are because they, I mean, and I, and I don't think it's a bad thing. Like, you know, Simon's talking about something that's happening globally. I don't think that we're bad or good or anything for, for doing this. I just think that um, this happens quite often. You know, they're the people who have, you know, who have, stepped on people on their way to the top, you know, with, you know, and are able to say, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that, look at me, look at me, look at me, are usually the ones that are like, wow, they've got all of these accomplishments, let's give them a chance. And we haven't really checked to see how their track record of how they're, as he says, with trust in how they're um, treating others. But I need to take a look at the comments, Devin, what did other people say? So we have um, just people echoing, like uh, Sarah sharing this 100% describes the most toxic person in my library. Um, comments of like, this is just really spot on. Um, Megan made the really good comment of like legacy toxicity seems super common in libraries, maybe an extension of that. We've always done it this way mentality. Um, and also Sarah um, mentioning vocational awe contributes to toxicity in libraries, which I think has is something that people have echoed as well. Um, right. We have no. a question um, from Kristen um, asking, how can we assess individuals on these skills for trust, like character questions or character without introducing bias? Um, I would say, you know, my, my suggestion when I'm, and I'm meet and work with libraries is to actually have a conversation with the library without the leadership there about what fit things that people felt that they needed or they need in order for them to feel inspired and, and valued and stuff like that. A lot of times your staff will know exactly what they want or need, or there's someone always in the organization, just sort of like what Simon says that is a great boss, right? There's always somebody who's really, really, really good. And, it's, and I, what I usually do is talk to them about what traits does people who are really great in there have outside of the, you know, they've got 10 years of experience and all this other stuff. People usually know that you usually can write that down. We sort of then create a document, sort of a vision of this is the, the leadership vision that we're looking for. And once you know what that vision is, then you want to, then you can develop questions that get at that. And a lot of those questions you can get online or something like that. 
like what's the top questions for listening, what's the top questions for empathy or whatever it is. I mean, it, it, to me, it's tailored towards your organization, but I think the staff should be involved. I mean, I don't think it should be leadership deciding this. I think it should be a exercise with all the staff working together to figure out what they feel like they need. And then from there, um, revising the job descriptions for leader positions that meet the needs of the staff, if that makes sense. We also have a question from Susanna asking, are there tools to better work towards addressing people of this nature if they're in middle management positions already? Yes, but that is a much longer discussion. And Devin, I would love to come back and talk about that because I could spend about an hour talking about that as well. But I would say, yes. And a lot of it has to do with leadership and the visioning things that I, uh, I was talking about earlier. Uh, one of the things you know um, that I've been thinking about working with ALA is creating a course for leaders on, on how to do exactly what I just said about how to bring people together, how to develop a better leadership strategic plan and how to then use that tool to keep people accountable for the for our new, healthier version of where we need to go. Um, and I would love to just kind of outline that probably in another session because I've got several more slides to go. But if you want to find out more information about it, please just you know let me know because I feel very passionate about that. I, I don't think a lot of things that we can change within the organization until we really start to take a critical look at how we hire our leaders. But let me keep going. All right. I work with the Navy. All right. So really quickly, um, here is some other things to keep in mind. Like I said, all of these things are just things for you to think about. Any other questions you might have, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me. One of the things in the workplace environment that I want you guys to realize and, and to that I stress a lot is there's a difference between the climate, the norms, and the culture, right? When you guys normally do, when a lot of times in, in a lot of organizations, what we tend to do is do a climate survey, a staff survey, a how are you feeling survey, you know, whatever. We want to get input from you guys. And that happens quite often. We do, a, we do a survey. And in a lot of cases, what staff end up telling me is that we do surveys over and over again every year, blah, 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 and nothing happens, right? And a lot of times the reason why something doesn't happen or something doesn't change is because all climate is doing is showing you what everything else that's going on in the organization, how does it make you feel, right? It's just a snapshot of everything that's happening within the organization and how it does it make you feel. Doing the survey and knowing how people feel doesn't automatically change the organization. It just, just literally gives you, tests the temperature of it. The reason I have here on the graphic that some of the leaves are dark and some of the leaves are green is what I was telling you before. Many times I find that, you know, one person is like, I'm having a great time. And the next person is like, I hate this place. And the next person is like, I'm indifferent from this place. People are all having a very, very different experience within the same organization, depending on what their boss, their, their situations, the policy is in that particular department conflict that's not being resolved, a variety of issues that are happening that in, even within the climate, everybody's not having the same vibe. And what I find is there's a lot of gaslighting, right? So if you're not having a good environment, then what I find is that somebody's like, well, I'm grabbing a great environment. So it makes you feel bad that why, do, why is it me or is it something else going on? And a lot of times I always want people to feel validated that if they're not having a good experience, even though somebody else is having the time of their lives, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. The other things of the norms, when you look at norms is, um, is your day-to-day -day policies. It's the, what is your employee manual? What time do you need to be at work? You know, how many days can you have remote? Can you do remote work? Uh, how's your performance evaluation? When do you do your performance evaluation? It's the day-to-day -day operational policies of your, you know, how do you govern in terms of your organization? A lot of times we, we don't look at those policies. Sometimes we do, but a lot of times we don't. So when the first thing, when you do a climate survey, it's great, but 
many times we need to actually evaluate the policies and other things that we do. And some of those things are written and some of those things are unwritten. But, but a lot of times when you find like, why are we doing this? A lot of times people don't know. It's just been written somewhere or unwritten somewhere. You know, this is what we're doing. And no one's really questioning it or have, an, have a space to question it. The culture is why, you know, a lot of times people say we need to change the culture. We need to change the workplace culture. We need to change the culture. Why culture is so hard to change is because it's underneath the surface. So in this, this graphic, you see it's the potatoes, it's the carrots or whatever. It's growing. It's there. It's underneath the surface. So a lot of times people were like, oh, could you come to our library and help us figure out the culture? If, if somebody says, I can do that, they're a liar. There's no way that I could come to your organization and figure out your culture in a day or even two days. It takes about six months to a year to figure out workplace culture. Many of the things that are happening in your workplace are unwritten. It's embedded. It's things that have been happening for a long time. It's been, you know, someone's there who you know, I always say that there's people there that are power brokers. They might not necessarily even be uh, in leadership, but who are determining culture, right? There is so many other things that are going on. And a lot of that stuff is unwritten. A lot of it is something that is completely not written down. I've had people who have invited me to come and talk about how to recruit more diverse people. And you find out that their unwritten policies is that certain people were going to get the positions anyway, right? And so, so the, they're saying that, like the first video says, they're saying the right things, but when you go deep into the root of the problems, you find something completely different. So the next time somebody says, hey, let's do another climate survey, that's fine. But in order to be really intentional of changing the organization, we have to get at some of the things that are happening within the culture. Culture is what changes the organization in the norms. It's not the climate. Climate is just a checkpoint as you're starting to change other things that actually will provide the changes that you're looking for. It will tell you whether things are changing or whether they're not. The last thing I want to talk about before you guys can ask me as many questions as possible is psychological safety. This is also, in, as it relates to trust, but it also is what a lot of people who talk to me privately is, this is where you're getting blindsided at work or being written up or being ignored or just not feeling like the organization has your back. And many times when people are really checked out at work, we really sit down and talk to them, it is that they don't feel the organization has their back. It's doing more with less and, and burning them out and they don't really seem to care. You feel very disposable and all those other different things that provide an environment that, you know, like they don't care about me, so I don't care about them. And in order to do that, we're gonna take another look at good old Simon. Um, I think this is also a good uh, sort of a nice video that kind of ties in with psychological safety. If you go back to the Paleolithic era, when Homo sapien first stepped foot on the planet, um, about 50,000 years ago, there were other hominid species that existed at the same time, but we were the ones that survived. They died. We weren't necessarily the strongest, we weren't necessarily the fastest, and yet we've done quite well. Look at this remarkable world that we've built. One of the huge advantages we had and have is that we are social animals. And things like trust and cooperation are absolutely essential for our survival. They're not just nice ideas, they're absolutely essential. Um, you can imagine why. When we existed, when we lived in populations that never really got bigger than about 150 people, for 40,000 of the 50,000 years we've been on this planet, we never lived in populations bigger than 150 people. I understand scale presents some inherent problems. Um, but you can, you can understand the benefits of the group living. What it meant was I could fall asleep at night and trust that someone in my tribe would watch for danger. If I didn't trust the people in my tribe, I couldn't go to sleep. 
And this is not a very good system for survival or performance or anything, any other metric. It's the same at work. When we work with people with whom we trust, I don't need to double check your work. I don't need to see it before it goes out to, you know, I don't need, you don't need my approval, right? When we have trust, we can let people go do their work. And even if they're subordinate, we don't need to double check or approve or anything. Things will happen because we trust them, because we all have each other's backs. We all have each other's interests in mind. The problem with things like trust and cooperation is that they are not instructions. I can't simply tell you, trust me. You can't simply ask people to trust you in your advertising, and you can't simply tell people, I want you two to cooperate. Trust and cooperation are feelings, and this is the problem. So the question is, where do those feelings come from? Now again, we are basic, pretty simple in, in our motivation and our constructions. You can imagine what life, what color should I use? You can imagine what life must have been like in these Paleolithic times. It was a world filled with danger. All of these forces working extremely hard to kill us. Whether it was the weather or lack of resources, saber-toothed tiger, Nothing personal, but all of these forces were working together to end our lives. And so, as tribal animals, we worked together and lived and worked amongst people around whom we felt safe. We felt like we belonged. And when we felt safe amongst the people with whom we lived and worked, the natural human response is trust and cooperation. It's just what happens. When we do not feel safe amongst the people with whom we work, however, the natural human inclination is cynicism, paranoia, mistrust, and self-interest. When we do not feel safe amongst the people with whom we work, if our leaders do not make us feel safe, we have no choice but to spend our own time and our own energy to protect ourselves from each other. When we do not fear each other, we naturally work together to face the dangers and seize the opportunities. It's the exact same thing in our modern business world. There are forces that are a constant and beyond our control that are working to kill you, right? Maybe I'm exaggerating, but there are forces outside, things like the uncertainty of an economy, the ups and downs of a stock market, a new technology that might render a business model obsolete overnight, um, your competition that sometimes is trying to kill you. It's trying to destroy that product or put you out of business, but at the very minimum is trying to frustrate your growth and steal your customers. These forces um, uh, are a constant and you have no control over them and never will. The only variable are the conditions inside the organization. And when those conditions are set in a manner that allows us to feel like we can trust and cooperate, we do. This is what leaders are supposed to do. So what do you guys think here? Any other thoughts? What do you what do you guys think? Somebody says that you can't force feelings. That is true. Um, but it is it is what I do like about his his work and what he what he says here is. What I find a lot of times when I when I talk to people is that I do get a lot of I told people to trust me. So, you know, like, what's the big deal? Right. Or people always sort of think that trust is something that's going to be constant. And to me, it, it happens over a continuum. Right. You could have high trust within an organization. Someone else could come in that, you know, is a toxic leader from that other one, um, you know, who somebody who has, you know, uh, high performance, low trust could come in and completely started to erode the organization and trust takes a downfall. It is not something that you can, that soon as you get to a level of trust that automatically stays there, it always sort of takes work in order for you to create environments where people um, basically, to me, seem like they have your back. And that whole example of what Simon said about 
you know, danger. It is, that is have your back that you can get things done without feeling that someone's going to stab you in the back or, or put you in a situation that um, um, is, is putting your job in jeopardy or anything like that. And, um, and I, when I listened to this video first, as I was doing my research, I thought about times when I was in a tenure environment where people were backstabbing each other on their way to the top and stuff like that. And I never really thought about that the sort of the cutthroat environment that I had in academia was based on the fact that we didn't, that we did not have a trust environment. Elena, we have a question from Megan asking, what does trust look like for an organization as a whole? Like, do I trust my library as an organization versus the trust for individuals within the organization? Can you separate these two at all? I think a, a lot of times it is the trust within the, the people within the organization. I mean, it's not only can I trust you know, my supervisor or, my, or the leader or whatever to do the right thing for me, but it is sort of, I mean, I've been in organizations for Megan that um, I trusted the leader. I felt that the leader had my back. I had my, my boss had my back, but I was in environments that I saw other employees um, backstab people and get people fired and all kinds of other things. And the reason why that was happening it's because the leaders were looking the other way they thought competition was good they thought people being you know ultra competitive was good for business and it really wasn't because you even though you know there was nothing going on with my supervisor it still was not a, a very good trust environment I, I still didn't trust my colleagues which still did add to an uncomfortable feeling so sometimes I think we could say, oh, it's just those colleagues, but it was still the environment that allowed that to grow. I hope that makes sense. It, it really was, even though, you know, the leader wasn't treating you like that way, she, she admitted she enjoyed the, the ultra competitiveness of the environment, um, which in some places it was good, in other places people ended up not being able to cut it and left. Okay, so it's more like um, you may not have that relationship with that person, but it was permissible and it, like there was an acceptance of that. It was, yeah, it was very clear that it was accepted. Yes. And Megan has a follow-up, sort of like the climate of trust versus the culture of trust maybe? Yes. Yeah, more like the climate of trust. Because like I said, in that, it really, it was in the culture. That was a good situation that you wouldn't have seen that offhand, that that was in the culture. I would have not known that that was the culture right offhand. It was just as I started to work within the tenure environment that I noticed that people were being let go um, and, and just how competitive it was and how people, you know, were kept telling me to watch your back at all times. And when I did mention it to leadership that this place was, you know, sort of ultra competitive. Um, they thought it was good for business. That was sort of their response. Uh, but moving on, uh, we want to look at strategic problem solving. This kind of goes back to what I was saying about burnout. When I when you state that um, we want to provide situations that are good for all, um, I do do another sort of sessions about um, about just very, very specific things uh, they have. I also have that outlined in my book if you wanted to, to get it or get it through interlibrary loan in terms of uh, specific items. But ultimately we want to go to what's called strategic problem solving. To me, this is especially really prevalent when we look at burnout because um, a lot of times only certain people are being heard. I, I saw that in your comments earlier that some people are being heard and other people are not being heard, right? And so a lot of times we are doing things that we probably could be doing it in a different way. We could probably be doing it a little bit more efficiently. Some of the things we might not need to be doing at all. But if we have an environment where people cannot state their opinions 
criticize or critique something that might doesn't seem to be working or not working anymore. Or maybe let's try a different way of approaching things, even if it falls flat on our face. Is there something that we can engage in strategic problem solving within our organizations so we are not suffering from board out? So we can't do things that, as I say, has people over policy. How can we as a group collectively, whether the security guard has a good idea, whether the cleaning staff has great ideas, is do we have a hierarchy of ideas? Can everybody, does everybody feel like they can participate in the strategic problem solving uh, thing? And that is actually the difference. When I've talked to places that have kind of guarded towards the burnout situation, they say they are active strategic problem solving. Anybody can come in and have a good idea. And as um, Michael Bush said earlier in Great Place to Work, is that idea something that leadership or whoever is listening to, right? Not only, oh yes, parroting what you're saying, but listening to it, you feel like your, your idea or your suggestion is being heard and evaluated and sometimes says, hey, let's try that, even if it works or it doesn't work, but can we participate in a process that allows for us to not feel so burned out, to allow us to not be doing more with less, to, to provide us a, an environment where we feel more valued and supported for all the time and effort that we're putting into the organization. So ultimately, we want to be at strategic problem solving. And the only way that it will really, really work is if everybody is able and, and active in that process. So um, we will we'll not do the whole thing with the polls everywhere, but let's talk a little bit about your organizations because I don't really wanna stress just on the negative. There is sometimes things that your organizations are actively doing to create a positive work culture. But like I said, another thing, if you don't remember anything from this talk is that it has to be active. It has to be things that you are doing. It's not left to chance um, that you feel like we are implementing in order to change our culture. And so let's get some suggestions from the chat. Mm -hmm. Transparency. Follow through addressing problems, communication, yes. Um, as you guys are writing it, uh, regularly check in minute readings with the director. Um, yes. Um, here's some other things that you guys can think of as you're starting to think about some other positive things that you can do. Yes. Also, um, I would always really stress is to invest in your organization in conflict resolution and not a one size fits all conflict resolution. Um, but I think the, there should be people who are trained in conflict resolution. And even if it's a train, the organization trained a trainer or whatever, I think those things need to be, we invest time and energy into that. I think another thing is um, um, in terms of um, how we're looking at recognition and praise. Um, there, it is the cheapest thing that we can do to start to create a positive work culture is figure out a way for you to recognize and praise everyone, not just the stars of the shows, not just to select few people, but what can we actively do to make sure people not only feel valued about what they're doing when they do something fabulous, but what they're just to let them know that whatever they're doing is, is great, even if it's not at some superstar level. That means that you know, you're know you talking to, like I said, the security guard, letting him know how great this is. The cleaning people, how valuable they are. People who are doing shelving books. This is why, this is wonderful. People who are, are students who are helping us out. How can we provide programs that allow for people to know that I see you? People want to be seen. People want to be heard. And how can we actively figure out, and this is active strategies. And what 
there's a lot of things. If you put in how to recognize and praise employees into a Google search, a zillion things comes up. So what of those things could we do to implement in order for us to, to start to recognize our, our staff? How can some of you guys put anything about performance evaluation? How can we change the performance evaluation to not just the open door policy with our, um, our leaders, but in terms of all middle managers and other people that where people are checking in, people are having a conversation. It's not just a yearly performance evaluation, but it's an ongoing dialogue um, and where we're feeling like we're moving together. Yes, I, I was reading some of your com comments. Yes, but a lot of it is, is how can we have a conversation? How can we look within the organization and make sure people are being seen and being heard? And especially for people who are maybe more quieter, more introverted, who are not going to be like, me, 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 look at me, look at me. You know, you want to make sure that those people are being seen and heard. One of the examples that I always give when I used to be a director that, um, that um, I didn't know before I started doing the research, I didn't even know that this was a tool, is that I had one of my shyest um, employees who was on the verge of being fired when she got to us. Um, she was in the last chance when she came to us and she was quiet. Um, she was worked the reference desk, but she never smiled. And people thought that she was very unfriendly, but, and she just didn't seem like it was very hard to get her out of her shell. One of the things that we found about her is that um, when you look at it from a strength-based perspective, is that she was the top, a very top researcher. She knew how to find things, right? And even people would, that came to our library would overlook sort of her gruffy look because she was the best researcher that we had. I also found out that she was a, a Mission Impossible fanatic. She loved Mission Impossible. So in one of my conversations with her, she told me that she watched Mission Impossible all the time. So what I did is that I would bring her down to my office and give her a mission and impossible assignment. So some research that I had to do as a director that I just didn't have time to do, I would like hand it to her and say, hey, I have a, a, an impossible assignment for you. Are you ready to take on the challenge? And she would say, yes, she would get it done. She didn't like a whole lot of praise in front of large groups of people, but I would recognize her separately you know, that I was so glad that she was able to get this done. Her work was so wonderful. This is why, you know, she's such a valuable part of the team. And slowly, once we were starting to do that and she was taking on more assignments and people start to see her for her great talent, which was research, really getting into the things, asking all the right questions, she started to bloom. She started to come out. We saw it for ourselves. She started to smile. She started to be more engaged. She started to feel more part of the team. And we saw her transform literally within months. And eventually she got so well that she ended up becoming head of a reference somewhere else, which was fine with us because we always wanted people to be the best versions of themselves. So how can we, you know, most people would ignore her and most of the people within the organization did ignore her and wrote her up and made her feel bad about herself because she was different. She was shy. She was very introverted, um, but she had amazing qualities. How can we find out who those people are? How can we figure out what makes them, what is their unique talents? What is their unique abilities? How can we make that and, and nourish that and help that grow? and help people be the best versions of themselves at work. So I'm gonna skip that and go to, before we go here is, what does this have to do with DEI? 
the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is a DEI thing. And some of the things that I want to stress from all of my research in, in, in consulting that I do on this topic is um, 80% or 90% of DEI programs, strategies, trainings, and stuff like that tend to not work. And the reason why these things do not work is because we do not focus in on the foundation of our organization. So many times what we do is we'll launch into DEI or DEIA or IDA or whatever language you're using activities. We'll just launch in with checklists and strategic plans and assessments and things like that. But we are not really looking at the culture in the environment that we have, right? So if people within the organization are burnt out, unhappy, you know, a lot of people more than more than not are miserable or do not enjoy working at their organization, how are you going to have programs that are supposed to be creating more inclusion and stuff, not only for BIPOC people, but for everyone, right? How are you doing that when people are not feeling like this is the best place to work? How can you recruit people in an organization where people already in the organization don't really like working where they're at, right? If you don't like working there, believe me, even if you're trying to recruit BIPOC people, people can tell the energy of whether or not you enjoy working here, whether or not you enjoy being part of this organization. I can't tell you how many people have done um, sort of minority or residency recruitment programs and put people in departments that they knew were problematic. And then when the person walked out, really giving the organization the finger on their way out, they're going like, why did the person leave? Well, you put them in a, you already put them in a situation that was not going to allow them to thrive. So a lot of times when I tell people before they launch into programs or they're in stuck in DEI, you know, sort of the band is almost almost about to break up because they don't really know what to do. We need to take a step back and look at the foundation of our organization. Do we have the structures? Do we have things in place? Are we, if we're bringing people within that organization, are we bringing them into departments or things that will allow them to do their best work? Do we have situations where we're working out differences where we can work out problems? Do we have um, appreciative inquiry? Do we have things where we have an environment that if they're having problems, they, they can get the resolutions? It's just a lot of other things that we need to have in place before we can start the DEI training. A lot of times we launch into the training without the foundational work. So that is it with me. Let me look at my time. I'm over. Sorry about that, Devin. Um, if you have any questions, that is the book. But if you have any questions for me, like I told you before, please let's reach out to me on my email or you could always give me a call or send me a text or anything like that. I am open for any uh, follow-up that you want to do. Thank you so much, Elena. I'll be sure to include your contact info in the follow-up email later today. Folks, thanks for sticking around a couple minutes over. Um, I hope you all got at least a couple of things to bring into your own work context. Um, if you're around tomorrow, join us for cultivating anti-racist and anti-bias workplaces with Dr. Kawana Bright. Elena, as always, so good working with you. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry for going over. No, no, no problem at all. Talk forever. Sorry about that. See you. All right, thanks a lot.